Good morning. This is Greg Cosgrove from the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to the next installment of the PFF uh, Disease Education Webinar Series. And um, we have uh, a really wonderful presentation today on, on a very important topic regarding um, environmental occupational exposures um, and its terms pneumoconiosis. And uh, to translate that, typically we want to talk about pulmonary fibrosis caused by occupational exposures. And, and it's an area that um, is of paramount importance because avoidance can um, be the, the primary treatment and awareness. Um, uh, hopefully, um, it, it is an aspect that um, um, we try to raise awareness about throughout the community uh, to physicians and prevent problems, but secondarily, we need to address them as soon as we can. So um, I'd like to um, introduce our, our presenter today and then also uh, my co-moderator. Um, but if we um, move to the next slide and then beyond, um, we're very, very privileged today to have um, Dr. Madhu Galati from the Yale uh, Interstitial Lung Disease Program Center of Excellence. And she actually has expertise not in interstitial lung disease alone, but also interstitial lung disease and um, is um, an expert in occupational environmental medicine as part of the division at Yale University, so brings in um, many different skills to help us understand how to um, think about occupational exposures, their potential risks, and their potential implications for patients who are having symptoms. Um, and uh, I, we're very fortunate to have as um, uh, co-moderating today, uh, Dr. Amy Harari uh, Case, uh, many of you know she's done some webinars with us in the past. She's from the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine, and she's an expert in interstitial lung disease at Piedmont Health. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Gulati as well as um, Dr. Harari Case. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you um, so much for the introduction. You're very welcome. So I <laughs> I'm going to get start I'm going to get started today. Um and I first of all want to thank the Pulmonary Fibrosis Foundation uh for the attention that they have actually been paying to exposures over the last uh last several years in particular. Um most of us who have most of our patients who come in who have pulmonary fibrosis are always wondering what caused it. And it can be very complicated to actually sort it out and and sometimes Many of you may have experienced, you get to the office and it's too difficult to figure out all the things that we may have been exposed to, so we sort of give up at the beginning. But I think that it's important to actually look at exposures. Um, and I'll be talking about the pneumoconioses today. Um, and with respect to the pneumoconioses, sorry, I'm just moving the slide too quickly. Um, the pneumoconioses are actually types of pulmonary fibrosis caused by occupational exposures that have been really recognized for centuries. And yet, in developed countries uh, like the United States, many of these uh, diseases have been on the decline. Um, now, part of that is because of regulation, is because manufacturing has moved offshore. Um, but regardless, I think on how um, both as patients and as uh, clinicians, we should be thinking about how exposures may re relate to disease, think about prevention. The matter is that if we aren't careful, some of these diseases, as I will, you'll see in later parts of the presentation, can come back if we're not careful about making sure that we are trying to limit exposures for patients with diseases. Prevention is really the key piece. So um, to give you a brief overview, I'm going to be talking about how pneumoconioses fit into the entire pulmonary fibrosis universe, and then talk mainly about the three main pneumoconioses. Uh, there are others, um, asbestosis, silicosis, and co-workers pneumoconioses. So pneumoconioses generally means dust in the lungs, literally. And pneumoconioses are caused by an inhalation of inorganic dust at work. So what that means is there's organic dust, which often relate to dust that come from plants and animals, and inorganic dust, which really relate to dust or particles that come from 
rocks and soils and maybe metals. And when the particles get small enough, less than 10 uh, microns in, in diameter, we think that they are small enough to actually reach all the way deep into the lung. And the most common pneumoconioses <clears throat> and the ones that are classically reported are asbestosis, coal workers pneumoconiosis, and silicosis, as I mentioned. There are other less common causes as well, such as aluminum, barium, graphite, iron, but I'm not going to be speaking about those today, although some of the principles that we'll be discussing will be similar. So if we think about the world of where does pneumoconiosis fit in the world of interstitial lung diseases or pulmonary fibrosis, and I generally broadly, we generally broadly categorize pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung diseases, and I apologize, I'm using them interchangeably, into diseases in which we really don't know the cause. I wanted to mention here Dr. Selikoff, who was really a pioneer in environmental and occupational medicine, and he really spent his uh, much of his career um, investigating links between asbestosis and lung disease, including mesothelioma, uh, which we'll talk about in a minute. And he became the founding director of the nation's first hospital division in occupational environmental medicine in Mount Sinai. And so really a tribute to many of the patient advocates have actually helped us understand these diseases. So what is asbestos? Asbestos is, refers to a group of six naturally occurring fibers. There are generally two categories. There are serpentine fibers, uh, which you would see on the right, and then there are amphibole fibers, which are here. Now, there is only one type of fiber within the serpentine fibers, which is chrysotile, and that actually constitutes 93% of what is used commercially. Uh, and there are many different forms of the amphibole fibers. Now, amphibole fibers are thought to be more toxic, but chrysotile fibers are used more often. Those are generally more commonly seen as the causes of asbestosis or asbestos-related lung diseases. So asbestos, literally meaning indestructible or in inextinguishable, is actually a pretty fantastic product, except for the fact that it caused a lot of lung toxicity. And the product itself was used um, because it had very good strength. It was flexible. You could use it for insulation. It would not be broken down by chemical reactions or high heat. Uh, it was resistant to electricity. And you could actually weave it into other products so that you could use it as insulation. And you can see in the pictures here how insulation was used around pipes and ceiling tiles. Many of us might actually remember some of those ceiling tiles from when we were growing up. Uh, roof shingles and asbestos insulated in a boiler. Now left undisturbed, these exposures generally do not cause problems. There are a number of occupations and industries that have been associated with asbestos. Uh, plumbers, pipe fitters, electricians, insulation workers, boiler makers, uh, even janitors. And then there are also a number of industries that have also been associated, shipbuilding, railways, uh, trucking, plastic and rubber. So when you're taking an occupational history, sometimes asking an individual if they had exposure may not be enough, especially if it was not something that they thought about. You want to actually also, we also as clinicians need to be asking what occupations and industries did you actually work in and for how long, because you may have actually had exposures that you may have not been aware of. The other thing that I'd like to mention also is the importance of passive or bystander exposure. So there's some people coming home and getting their clothes washed by their spouses who then in turn develop asbestos-related lung diseases or other individuals who may not have worked directly with a product, but worked near somebody who worked with the product, who was not wearing appropriate protection, who also were uh, exposed and then developed asbestos-related diseases. Now, asbestos does not just cause asbestosis, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. Asbestos causes several different types of lung abnormalities. Asbestos-related pleural abnormalities are quite common. Uh, and oftentimes they don't actually cause any symptoms. And in the picture here, you see that uh, on a CAT scan view, you see this sort of white plaque here that's called a pleural plaque, which is 
perspective that somebody has been exposed to asbestos. Now, the plaques themselves, as I said, are generally benign and don't usually cause any particular symptoms. And they often don't develop as all of the asbestos-related lung findings until many years afterwards. Cancer has also been associated with, um, with asbestos exposure. Both cancer of the pleura, and the pleura is the lining of the lung that surrounds the lung. And in the picture down here, you can see that the lining of the lung uh, right here is actually quite thick. And there's also some of these white spots, which are calcified. And this is a rare cancer of the lung that is really typically only caused by asbestos exposure. And again, doesn't happen until maybe even 30 years after exposure. Lung cancer is also something that individuals who are, are at increased risk for. Um, and in addition, smoking greatly increases that risk along with asbestos to cause lung cancer. And then finally, asbestosis. So asbestosis refers specifically to the scarring of the lung caused by asbestos exposure. So only one of those elements that I described on the prior page. So how do we diagnose this? How do we diagnose asbestosis? History, physical, pulmonary function testing, x-rays, and biopsies are rarely needed when you have a good history or a compatible history. So on your history, typically, you have an individual who typically describes years and years of asbestos exposure. It's possible for brief, intense periods of exposure to cause disease, but more typically, it is chronic over a number of years. The disease appears years after exposure started, so anywhere between 10 to 20 and even over 20 more typically. Breathlessness comes on slowly and often does not show up until after an individual stopped working. And then, of course, there's the, not the dry cough often plagues people. On physical examination, you may see inspiratory crackles on lung examination or clubbing, sort of the change in the shape of the fingernails that also is seen in some of the other, uh, fibrotic diseases. Now, breathing studies generally, just like most other uh, pulmonary fibrotic diseases, you end up having a restrictive lung defect, which is really because the lungs are so scarred up when inhale as deeply, so the lungs are what we call restricted. Occasionally, you can also see some obstruction, which means that there's some inflammation or some disease along the airways, um, and that may be because somebody has smoked or because they may have COPD with it, um, or simply because when we inhale exposures, it also affects the airways. Low diffusion capacity, which is generally once the air is in there, the scar prevents the oxygen from going in from the, from the lungs into the bloodstream. And then certainly low oxygen levels, classically seen maybe not when at rest, but when somebody takes a few steps, the oxygen levels tend to plummet. So on chest x-ray, and many individuals who are, have been exposed to asbestos or are involved in asbestos screening program, have uh, what we have here are these lower lobe, interstitial, small lines, reticular markings that we see in the lung. And the International Labor Office actually publ uh, publishes a standardized way to interpret chest x-rays, not just for asbestos, but for all the pneumoconioses. And they have to be performed by a certified B reader. This classification does not exist for CT scans right now, but it does exist for chest x-rays. What would it look like on CAT scan? Well, here's an example of a CAT scan here, where as I, as I showed the pleural plaque on the slides before, where on the lining of the lung, you see some white spots on that lining. And then on the CAT scans, you see some reticular markings, little lines here. You may see some destruction of the lung or honeycombing. And this occurred in the patient, a 78-year-old patient with a chronic dry cough and breathlessness. Need a biopsy? Well, generally, no. Biopsies are really rarely needed. Generally, the occupational exposure history will really suffice, will give enough, enough information that the person has been exposed, particularly exposed at a time where regulations may not have actually already occurred or have been put into place. 
A time where a biopsy may actually be helpful is when patients are not sure if they actually had exposure um, or if they may have had a bystander exposure or that spouse that I mentioned before who may have been doing the laundry of a worker who worked with asbestos. In addition to history, CAT scans, the plural plaques that I showed on previous pages, is also enough to show that somebody's been exposed to asbestos in the past because there are very few other things that give that. If you do bronchoscopy, one thing to be, if you do do a biopsy, there are two ways to obtain tissue. One is to do a bronchoscopy and take fluid from the lung and send it to the laboratory. And another way is to take a biopsy, either by a bronchoscopy um, or an actual lung surgery. Now, the body has a way of clearing out foreign material. So just because asbestos is not seen in the lung tissue does not mean that you have not actually had exposure in the past. So that's one important point. The second important point is that you're not going to just see asbestos bodies in the lung, one has to actually specifically ask the pathologist to do what we call an iron stain. And what the iron stain does is that it coats the asbestos bodies in the lung tissue. So there has to be a very specific request to the pathologist to look for this. Now, the iron stains don't tell you what's inside. There are some more sophisticated techniques that I just put here for interest and to show the pictures. However, this is really not available in most laboratory, uh, laboratory uh, pathology labs. However, scanning electron micros microscopy is a, is a very uh, specific way of finding, um, a sophisticated way of using a microscope um, to find uh, evidence of these fibers. And basically what it does is you send an electron beam through the surface, and then there's a further analysis to tell you exactly what's contained in those fibers. And of course, you can see more fibers in this than you can otherwise. Again, again typically you're not able to actually do this in, uh, in standard patients um, because this is not generally available. In terms of treatment for asbestos, Unfortunately, there really is no treat. There is no current treatment for generally oxygen therapy, physical therapy, uh, treating symptoms of shortness of breath and cough. Is there a role for future antifibrotics? Well, certain studies that uh, have been recently published looking at whether or not using some of the antifibrotic drugs that are on the market Esbriet and OFEV um, to see if there is any evidence of slowing of disease progression. And those, those, uh, those things are currently under review. And then, of course, there's lung transplantation in those patients who progress enough to, to, need, um, to, need, uh, to need new lungs. So what's happening with asbestosis in the current era? Well, asbestos is a really success story. And if you look at the slide here, you can see that asbestos consumption between uh, 1950 and 1990, and the black area here represents the United States, really was reduced significantly. And along with that, particularly since there's a delay, one can see that there was a reduction over time in the number of individuals who died from asbestosis. Regulations began in the 1970s. In 1989, there was an asbestos ban, but the rule was overturned, um, although most industries had actually gotten rid of most asbestos, and there were certainly regulations for specific industries. And the Occupational Safety and Health Administration currently requires, uh, requires surveillance and has regulations for exposures. So who is currently uh, at risk? Well, the risk is really the legacy of older workers, people who've been exposed in the past, individuals who are currently doing asbestos abatement uh, or renovation, some new products, and developing countries. So what are the regulations for asbestos? Well, there were standards for construction, general industry, and shipyard. OSA requires that workplaces do exposure monitoring in the areas to make sure that exposure, that there are sufficient exposure limits. 
Um, there's a term called permissible exposure limit, which requires which OSHA chemical substances. And for asbestos, for example, an individual is only allowed to have an less than an average of 1.1 fiber per cubic centimeter um, over eight hours. So it's a very specific limit on how long somebody can be exposed and to what intensity. Hazard awareness training has to happen for all workers. Personal protective equipment is, is incredibly important. And you can see that it's not just a matter of wearing any kind of nuisance or dust mask. You see the individual here who is um, involved with asbestos is wearing um, an entire uh, entire body suit, has got a respirator on, and has an air purifying respirator on as well. Also has coveralls, rubber boots, disposable gloves, safety goggles. And in addition, when there are needs, you actually take the clothes off. You don't want to actually make sure, you want to make sure that you're not contaminating yourself in that process. So there's a whole process of um, of decontamination. And then finally, medical monitoring is required for those uh, individuals, including spirometry, just limited lung function testing, x-rays uh, at least every, every few years um, on individuals as well, because remember the disease does not show up until many years later. So let's move on to coworkers pneumoconiosis. And this, I think, is a, the recent increase in co-workers pneumoconiosis that has been described in the news is a good lesson for us in terms of showing that continued surveillance and monitoring is incredibly crucial and constantly reevaluating the workplaces. So just like asbestos, coal mine dust lung disease actually is not just one type of lung disease. It includes COPD, so emphysema diffuse dust lung disease, or other types of pulmonary fibrosis, and coal workers pneumoconiosis. So coal workers pneumoconiosis is very specifically a type of lung disease caused by SCAR, or caused by inhaling coal mine dust. So what is coal mining dust? For many of you who've worked in workplaces, one knows that you're not necessarily exposed only to one exposure. Often the exposures are a mixture. And coal mining dust is a very classic example of that. Coal mining dust contains carbon, silica. Depending on the equipment and the areas that the individual may be working, it may also include diesel exhaust from the machinery, bioaerosols, carbon monoxide, and other gases. And like asbestos, exposure over many years can also cause lung disease, although some individuals will develop disease earlier. What is for asbestos, one of the important things with any exposure-related lung disease, not just about whether or not the exposure, there are certain factors that are going to increase the type of exposure that you may have or the dose of exposure you may have. Think about are, are you working in the mine? Are you working in an underground mine where there's less ventilation? Is it a surface mine? How many hours are you working? Um, how far do you have to drill into the rock to extract the coal? And if you're working in an enclosed space, is there good ventilation? The other thing is when you are working with a substance, you're drilling or you're cutting or you're blasting rock, those things can, as you can imagine, release more particles into the air. And whenever things are released into the air, those are things that you can inhale. So some of these things in terms of engineering dust controls and ventilation can also make a huge difference in literally the amount of dose that you're going to be exposed to. So again, how do you diagnose this? Well, history of exposure, symptoms, spirometry and pulmonary function testing, and again, biopsy here is rarely needed. And so this is quite similar to when we think about taking a history of an individual, as we mentioned, uh, with asbestos exposure. Spirometry and pulmonary function testing, if you have co-workers pneumoconiosis, again, generally shows restrictive or restricted lungs because of all the scar, but occasionally you can also have obstructive lung disease as well, which could either mean that you have COPD because COPD is also associated with coal mining, or you have some airways disease. And again, typically a biopsy is rarely needed.
Now, some of the differences that have been described. Now, co-workers pneumoconiosis, not everybody develops symptoms. Sometimes people just live with an abnormal chest x-ray for their entire lives, but they have no symptoms. And in those situations, one can continue to follow the patient. Some patients will progress. And risk factors may be certain types of co-workers pneumoconiosis, such as progressive massive fibrosis or smoking. And sometimes individuals will describe coughing up black sputum or blood-tinged sputum. Chronic shortness of breath is also associated. So what are the two types of co-workers pneumoconiosis? On the right, we have simple pneumoconiosis, which in this x-ray, and it may be difficult to see, you have these very small little nodules that are um, in the lung fields. These nodules tend to be less than 10 millimeters in size. And over here, you see that those small nodules have all combined together to create something called progressive massive fibrosis. Um, and so these are sort of, the, these are the two types of coworkers pneumoconiosis. Note that these nodules are very different from other types of pulmonary fibrosis and also different from asbestosis, which may look much more similar to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I show again the ILO classification, and this is an example of what the radiologist uh, who's looking at your, who, who are grading the x-ray abnormalities would be actually filling out. And so this is also standardized for co-workers pneumoconiosis, just like it is for asbestosis. So again, similarly, supportive care, oxygen, physical therapy, symptomatic therapy, observation really for those individuals who don't have any symptoms. And medications, again, there are studies um, potentially occurring that will be looking at antifibrotics for, uh, this, uh, for these type of diseases as there is really no treatment, medical treatment for this right now. And then lung transplantation in selected individuals. So over the years, co-workers pneumoconiosis had actually come down substantially and, and it's actually gone down um, more than 30% in the mid seventies of uh, long tenured workers underground had evidence of co-workers pneumoconiosis and three and a half percent actually had progressive massive fibrosis. Now, by the late 1990s, that went as low as 5% and 0.5%. But at some point after that time, the prevalence of co-workers pneumoconiosis, so the, the number of people started increasing. Um, and so the concern was so that in a recent, a more recent data has suggested that individuals, uh, particularly in central Appalachia, uh, who had been working for a long period of time, over 20 years, had evidence of co-workers pneumoconiosis, about 20% of them, and 4.5% of them had more of the severe form. So a greater proportion of these patients have developed progressive massive fibrosis. So what happened? Well, to take a step back, surveillance had been mandated by the Federal Coal Mine Safety Act that had, in 1969, established a health surveillance program in the National Institute of Occupational Safety and like asbestos screening programs, health surveys, spirometry or breathing studies, and chest x-rays. In terms of surveillance for coal workers pneumoconiosis, in 1969, the Federal Coal Mine Safety Act established a mandatory health surveillance program, and that included health surveys, spirometry, and chest x-rays. In addition, there was a fund put aside to pay for this called the Black Lung, uh, Black Lung Benefits. So after the rise of co-workers pneumoconiosis, 2014, Mine Safety and Health Administration passed new regulations, which included surface coal miners. Previously, it had only included underground, uh, underground miners because the thought was there would be more exposures for those who are working underground than above on the surface. The exposure levels were actually reduced and there was also a requirement for individuals to actually have exposure monitoring. So workers, for example, who had disease could actually have something attached to them where there was a continuous sampling of the exposures that they had. So rather than having an exposure monitor somewhere in the corner of the workplace, that thought of actually putting it really on the person or the worker gave you a better sense of what they were breathing in.
So we should be seeing uh, improvement over the next several years. Sometimes there's certainly a delay because these diseases are, there's a latency period between exposure and disease. So we look forward to seeing um, the effects of this regulation. But again, a lesson, even when you think something's been eliminated, you have to actually continue to monitor. So let's move on to silicosis. So silica and the fact that silica has been associated with lung disease was recognized even by Hippocrates, so eons ago. And there are currently 2.3 million US workers who are exposed. Um, and between 1993 and 2013, it was listed as a contributing cause of death for over 2,000 people. Now abroad, there are more cases, uh, half a million cases and over 10,000 cases in South Africa, for example. Um, so this is not just a problem here, it's a problem worldwide. So what is silica? Well, silica is a naturally occurring mineral and it represents about 60% of the Earth's crust. There are two types of silica and silica is really formed by a chemical reaction between silica and oxygen. The two types are, uh, are crystalline silica, which is the form that's considered toxic, and then amorphous silica. Now, crystalline silica has sort of a pattern um, and has a structure to, um, to the silicon dioxide, whereas amorphous forms of silica don't have a structure, sort of the simplest way to explain it. So several processes release silica. So crushing, grinding, blast, sand blasting, all these things can actually release silica into the air. And silica can come in many forms. The most common uh, silica mineral is quartz, and that's actually something that's found um, in granite and sandstone. And then of course, there's silica that exists in combined forms with other materials. Like asbestos, there are a number associated with silica exposure, including mining, tunneling, uh, hydraulic fracturing, stone, ceramics production, foundry work, and oftentimes, individuals may not even know that they actually have had silica exposure. Like the pneumoconiosis, silica dust is not just associated with uh, pneumoconiosis, it's associated with other forms of lung disease. Uh, it is associated with chronic bronchitis or emphysema. It's associated with uh, interstitial, uh, other forms of interstitial lung disease or polyposis. Um, a rare form of interstitial disease called protein alveolar proteinosis. There seems to be an increased risk of lung cancer in these patients. Interestingly, there is an increased risk for developing active TB uh, for those who may have been exposed. And then finally, there we will be talking about silicosis. Also interesting with silica is that silica has been associated with a number of autoimmune diseases, such as scleroderma, and it's also been associated with renal diseases. So again, same thing in terms of diagnosing silicosis, we wanna look at exposure, symptoms, pulmonary function testing, and biopsy is really ne rarely needed. Like coworkers pneumoconiosis, many have no symptoms. There's a dry cough, shortness of breath that those um, may report. And again, here are the two forms. There's a sim simple nodular silicosis seen here on the right, where you have a proliferation of nodules in the upper lung fields. You can also see this on the CAT scan here. And then progressive massive fibrosis here where those nodules actually coalesce. Now, most patients who develop silicosis will report having 10 plus years of low exposure over a long period of time. However, there are other individuals who develop disease after a high intense exposure or develop accelerated disease or rapidly progressive disease after a moderate amount of high exposure. Biopsies, just like in asbestosis, are rarely needed. History is usually sufficient. But if they are done, then typically what you would see um, is what we call a silicotic nodule, which you see this sort of rounded like structure here uh, on biopsy. And what that really is, is, is interlacing bu bundles of scar tissue. And if you apply a special technique called polarized light, light through the specimen in a particular plane, you can see these bright objects in there, which actually represent the silica particles. Treatment again, similar to the other pneumoconioses, supportive care, question of whether or not there'll be a role for antifibrotics and lung transplantation may be uh, needed in these patients. 
certainly screening for tuberculosis uh, exposure in the past is certainly needed as this has been described. Uh, there have been reports of using steroids in these patients, but uh, generally not considered to be very effective as most of this disease is generally scar. So what are the protections in place? Well, the protections in place, again, permissible exposure limits um, exist by OSHA, protective equipment, um, administrative controls, and engineering controls. Some of the engineering controls we talked about, for example, in the coal mines, here's an example of somebody jackhammering. And notice that things as simple as actually having water spray, which literally makes the dust go to the ground, so it's not up in the air, so you can inhale it. Those are things that can actually make a difference. Um, you can also notice that he is wearing um, a respirator as well. Interestingly, there have been new outbreaks of silica, uh, or new reports of silica. So for example, the stone countertops uh, that are often used in kitchens now, there's been reports of severe silicosis in, indiv in individuals who have been working with engineered, um, engineered stone. Now that type of stone actually tends to have a very, very high amount of silica in it. Um, and that is likely why uh, somebody may have a higher risk for developing it. And the above report from a number of states, um, California, Colorado, Texas, and Washington reported about 18 workers, including two, uh, who, um, two fatalities. Silicosis has also been uh, reported in dental technicians uh, from the work that they do as well. And this was a case of five individuals who had uh, been working with, um, who had been working as dental technicians um, as well. So it may pop up, your exposures may actually pop up in, a, in different places. So to summarize key points, pneumoconioses are types of pulmonary fibrosis that are generally due to prolonged chronic occupational exposures, inorganic dust exposures, as we mentioned. Diagnosis usually requires history and imaging alone. Biopsies are rarely needed. Many workers do not have symptoms, but others can progress. Long latency periods. So by the, t by the time somebody develops symptoms, many, many years may have passed surveillance or looking for disease or awareness that the disease may occur must stay on for years even after the exposure is on. Importantly, limiting exposure can reduce disease, and those reductions of exposure can not only occur through regulating or making sure that the workplaces are reducing the overall levels, but they can through engineering controls and personal protective equipment. And finally, as I mentioned, as an example of silica uh, reports in, uh, in different workers, um, in those who worked with engineered stone or in dental technicians, workers' pneumoconiosis suggests that old exposures can show up again. Disease can show up in new settings. And finally, prevention and regulation work. And it's important to actually comply with those over time and be aware of them. So with that, um, I think that completes my, my talk, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Galati. I, I was sitting there, and, and from my perspective as a physician, I, I see the decades and decades of efforts of really trying to protect patients with these known exposures, and, and you've really detailed the importance of that here. I, I, put myself in the position of a patient sitting, maybe listening, who says, well, I, I didn't work in any of those situations, but when I go to work, I'm worried because there is dust or there, there are other vapors to which I'm exposed, and, and I don't feel as well when I'm at work compared to when I'm at home. What do I do if I'm worried about this work-related potential exposure? And, and perhaps you and, and Dr. Case could comment on that. It's a, it's a very difficult question. I think, you know, there, there are a number of things. I think we are all looking, you know, my personal bias is that I do think that there are exposures that have caused many of these, you know, even what we call idiopathic diseases, and perhaps for some there are genetic predispositions. You know, a few things. I think uh, one question is, Oftentimes, it's important to know that oftentimes people do not have symptoms while they're being exposed. 
Um, and so often if they're having symptoms, it, so often it may not, they may not have symptoms till years later. In terms of exposures that you know, just pulmonary fibrosis, for example, I mean, metal dust and wood dust have very commonly been reported in the, in the literature. Um, agricultural exposures have also been uh, reported. Smoking is actually a risk factor, not necessarily as strong as COPD uh, in terms of developing emphysema, but all these risk factors have, have certainly been described. What I generally tell patients, because it's sort of a, it's a complex question, is that, you know, I do generally worry about individuals breathing in a significant amount of dust, gases, vapors, and fumes, and I worry that they're going to develop progressive disease. Um, sometimes financially, it's not possible to actually leave the job immediately. Um, what I often try to do is, is to uh, ask them to make sure they, um, using as much personal protective equipment as they can. So making sure they're using a mask. Um, so and sometimes it's not just work, it's hobbies. You know, people are doing things at home that are also dusty. And I think those protections can actually make a difference. If individuals allow us to, I often refer to my occupational medicine colleagues who can call the workplace or do a visit. You know, workplaces, as you can imagine, don't really always like medical places coming in and saying, hey, you know, you got to improve your ventilation system in here or you got to move the worker. So it becomes, you know, it, it becomes complicated. Um, it becomes complicated. I, I like to make sure people have reductions in exposure. The other thing I want to say is that historically, for those who are developing a disease later in their years, the exposure levels have come down substantially since OSHA has you know, brought down exposure levels um, in the 70s and 80s. So it is possible that the exposure that they currently have is not the same degree of exposure um, that they had many years ago. Um, so that's, that's my general answer. Dr. Case, I don't know if you had any other thoughts that uh, you can think of or how you deal with it in the clinic? Yeah, I would echo a lot of the things that you would say that um, it, is a, it is a challenge and a pro-con um, kind of decision about what to do in those workplaces for those people who, who are still in those work environments. It's a little easier for things that are um, more optional like hobbies and um, we have more control over how to um, avoid uh, exposure or use personal protective equipment and things like that. But, um, but I do agree that, you know, getting that, going back to the beginning, just getting that thorough history of not, not just what was your job title, but what, what do you, what do you do in that job? What, what was the job before that? And, and what were your responsibilities? And, um, and, uh, and, and then, you know, how long has that has that been? How long was that? How long has it been since then? Um, and really talking about those more current exposures too, because you've laid out some very clear examples. But I think there are a lot of mixed exposures, as you alluded to, particularly with the um, coal dusts, um, and that that have less well-defined uh, patterns and associations, but could still be um, problematic for people. So. That's great. The other I, thing I wanted, the other thing, I'm sorry, I just wanted to add one more thing. The other thing that's very helpful, and I think this is how the early epidemiologic studies, was that somebody noticed that multiple people in the workplace had the same disease. And that is often the first clue. Um, but, you know, you really have to take the time. One of the most significant questions I ask is, is anybody else in your workplace, do they have lung disease that you know about it? Now, that assumes somebody still knows the people from many years ago. But I, that's a very important question. It can kind of be a clue because you don't actually, you don't get so many rare diseases in one place that it's, it's too much of a coincidence for that to happen. That's a really good point. It's... Um... It's always challenging when you identify a potential risk or patients are concerned about it. I think what, what you're suggesting, it's really hard to prove the link between a potential exposure and the, the symptoms and the disease. And that's not something that I think uh, many of us can do on the first visit, but um, really takes a, a dedicated serial evaluation to understand. And, and sometimes that, that can't happen in a 20 minute visit when you're first starting to get to know someone. So um, maybe to set expectations for patients is to really think about things 
um, document, as Dr. Case said, what you did and how long you did it for in terms of the job responsibilities. And it was a, a week versus you did it every way, every day for, for six years. That will help your physician better understand the, the exposure risk uh, moving forward. But it's, it's really a, um, a challenging task um, to implicate an exposure into a a disease process, at least that's my experience of not being an occupational environmental specialist like you are, um, but any guidance in terms of setting expectations for patients? What I usually tell them, unless it's a known, unless there's a very well-established literature or if there's an outbreak in a workplace, that it is really hard to prove exposure no matter what I believe. Um, and I think, you know, some of the, I tell them that it's possible, but from at least a medical legal standpoint, you know, what lawyers and workplaces want to hear is that it's a probable exposure. And to prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt is actually very difficult um, because there's such a long latency period. Because, you know, if you do a biopsy on somebody, you might not find anything in there. I mean, can you look for some of these exposures? Well, the lung often clears it up. So you may not find anything or you don't know what it means. Um, so it is, it's very difficult to prove. Um, there's probably some gene environment, um, gene environment interaction that also, um, occur as well. Uh, so it is, it is, I do try to tell people that I believe and I believe your environment. I believe, you know, I, I, I do wonder in the back of my mind, um, whether or not this contributed to your disease. And I'd like you to limit it, limit ongoing dust gases vapor exposures but i don't know that i'd be able to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt um, that it was causative and i think that's the hard part about a lot of medicine is we can't um, oftentimes have definitive proof as to the cause of a particular disease but that doesn't mean we can't uh, reduce risk as you mentioned try to reduce exposure if we're if we have those concerns to to prevent further injury, um, but uh, it, it can be put us in a challenging situation. Another question that came up is, I think something that we all see and love your opinion is, what about when you're handling concentrated cleaning chemicals, so the materials you use before you dilute them, and could they be causing uh, pulmonary fibrosis or exacerbating pulmonary fibrosis? I'll, I'll just call out maybe strong bleach or ammonia or some of the solvents um, that people are exposed to, um, and then they develop a spatial associated cough. Um, how do you handle that when in your clinics? So I think, you know, generally when I think about cleaning products or some of those irritants, I think more of Often I think about uh, asthma-like symptoms, and there's there's certainly been a lot of interest in looking at the um, relationships between cleaning products and, and asthma-like symptoms. You know, is there a case series of individuals who've inhaled this who developed acute exacerbations? I mean, I again, I generally prescribe to patients, please try to avoid, you know, gases, vapors, and fumes, because often when people describe having have an underlying chronic lung disease exposed to these kind of irritants. Um, so I certainly don't rule out the possibility that it can impact things, uh, whether or not there's a, a well-established literature on it. Um, I don't think there is. Dr. Case, any? You... Yeah, so I was going to say we cut out on your audio there for just a second, but I think you were saying what I was I was thinking was that um, you know, even if there's not a well-established link to being a cause or worsener of pulmonary fibrosis, certainly exposure to these things can even just temporarily make people's symptoms worse. And so that might be a good enough reason to avoid them when possible. Um, I, I have plenty of patients who will say that some of these inhalational irritants make them cough, make their, you know, chest still tight, shortness of breath. And that that's just... Um, exacerbating some of the symptoms that they feel from their pulmonary fibrosis to start with, so. Yeah, pre prevention is always um, the best part, regardless of what disease you have to prevent worsening, whether it be coronary disease or, or lung disease. And um, I, I kind of use the phrase, if um, 
whether it's smog, fog, if you're in Hawaii, or exposures at work, anything that's irritating your lungs certainly doesn't help you feel well. Um, it may not under, um, exacerbate the underlying disease, but at the end of the day, it's, it's causing you to have more symptoms. And so trying to avoid it the best you can. Um, different parts of the country have, have seasonal fires. And here in Colorado, um, many patients have significant exposure to particulate material from the, the fires in the forest. And, and then it exacerbates their lung disease, regardless of what it is. So um, trying to avoid those exposures is really important, whether they're at home or environmental or at work. Um, it, it's good common sense. Um, and hopefully it doesn't progressively worsen the disease, but uh, it's important to, if you're having symptoms to talk to your physician, to, to have an open discussion as to if things are, are changing, that's when we really wanna understand and, and hopefully implement whether it be treatment, which could be avoidance or, or other um, uh, treatments that perhaps it is related to asthma and not your pulmonary fibrosis. So it's, a, it's an important discussion to have, not just once, but anytime things change. Um, I'm looking to see if um, there's an, we address the one question. And Jennifer, I don't see that there are a lot of other questions coming up right now. Um, so we're almost towards the end of the hour, so I'll give an opportunity to, for Dr. Galati and Dr. Case to make any, any final comments. I'll just say I think this was a wonderful discussion of um, some of the known pneumoconioses that give an example of how we approach the things that we understand about workplace exposures, um, occupational environmental exposures, um, and how those you know, might apply to our our, we might apply those clinically to our patients, um, but also the importance of reducing and, um, the exposures to our workforce through regulation and um, controls and so on, preventing disease. Great. Yeah. Dr. Go ahead, Dr. Galati. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I, I think I've tried to emphasize the importance of sort of regulation and advocacy and prevention. I think it's such a, it's such a key factor. Um, but, you know, as you mentioned, it takes a lot of time to, to spend time with the patient and, and get a history. And, and I think, you know, I think as clinicians, we need to do our best, a better job to try to take the time to find to find these things as well, because it can have such a tremendous impact. And, you know, while some of these diseases are on the decline here, there's certainly, you know, we haven't talked a lot about the developing countries, but they certainly, you know, overseas tend to, to struggle with these issues as well. So. You've been part of an initiative to maybe try to consistently evaluate and help individuals with a questionnaire. I know that's an evolving process. Do you want to maybe touch base because that could be a resource for patients as well as physicians? Yeah, no, it's, you know, many centers have um, have tried to design um, an exposure survey just to try to standardize the questions that we ask. One, to make sure we take a complete history for things that we know may be related. And two, you know, we need to be looking for other disease, you know, looking for other potential exposures. You know, we're really relying on people to remember. Um, oftentimes people will have what's called recall bias and they'll really try to think of something. They may not remember all the exposures. And of course, we don't want to make the exposures to the exposure surveys are so long. Your visits are already so long. So, you know, we try to, there's been a lot of work in trying to figure out, you know, how do we get the right amount of information, um, get the same information from other people and allow people to expand. I think it's a really uh, important area um, as well. So that may be something that's available in the future to help patients and physicians as part of the foundation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, fabulous. I think we have one minute left. I'll take the opportunity to thank both of you for joining. Thanks the audience for um, participating um, in the webinar. This will be available and so you can go back and, and it's a lot of information in a short period of time so you can take your time. It will be on our website over the next several weeks. If there are additional questions, please forward them to um, the foundation and we'll try to address them as you think about them um, through the Patient Communication Center. And thank you again, Dr. Galati. Thank you, Dr. Case. Really appreciate your time and uh, diligence in, in raising awareness about pneumoconiosis and exposures in general. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the invitation. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Have a great day. Bye-bye.